friends, good to see you again on In Conversation. You must have heard Prime Minister Narendra Modi say that the G20 Leaders Summit in New Delhi will be the biggest that the grouping has ever seen. What is G20, you might ask? It is the premier forum for global economic cooperation. Its 20 member states account for 85% of global GDP. The decisions there are taken by consensus. They are not legally binding, but member states make commitments that carry significant political weight. Today we are in conversation with one representative of a G20 member state in New Delhi, Mexican ambassador to India, Frederico Salas Lotfe. We will talk to him about India's G20 presidency, about the Mexico-India relationship and more. Welcome ambassador to DD India. Namaste. Namaste. Thank you very much for having me. Pleasure. 200 G20 meetings in 60 Indian cities, and you've attended quite a few of them, as is evident from your X account. How has your experience been? Oh, it has been an extraordinary experience for a number of reasons. One of them, uh, a learning experience for me to go to all these different meetings on the different topics that have been on the agenda of the G20. Uh, but secondly, also, because I have been privileged to, to go to so many places here in India, and benefit from the generous hospitality that India has bestowed upon all the delegates that have attended these meetings, which has been really quite wonderful. So it's uh, uh, you know it's so nice to be in these places that I, some of them which I had not been before, uh, and also as I said you know the the uh, you know the, there were cultural performances, there were excursions to some places of interest in the vicinity of where the conference was taking place. So it has really been a very wonderful experience for me. I noticed you promoting some Mexican films uh, being screened at the G20 Film Festival. That's now, correct. this is again a first under any presidency, hosting a G20 Film Festival, that is. Do you think that uh, this will serve to bolster the soft power of G20 member states and also improve people to people ties, have more camaraderie between peoples? Oh, absolutely. I think we are promoting this, uh, this film. And also, we are participating in other cultural programs that have been organized by the G20 Secretariat. Uh, we're bringing some works of art from Mexico. We're showcasing uh, some textiles from Mexico, for example, at the National Gallery of, of, of Art. Uh, and other such things. We're participating also the uh, something that was organized again by the G20 uh, Secretariat of uh, Poems from, from the different G20 countries. So I think all of this is very good because it's, uh, of course, it brings people closer. It opens up uh, the, a window of vision into the, our different cultures, our different manifestations. So I think it's very important that this is taking place. And of course, it enhances the, the soft power that uh, that we as a group have uh, in the international community. So in a sense, it's a very active participation of Mexico in that the G20 correct. meetings in yeah. India. Could you find time to see any of the films? Uh, <laughs> I will see the Mexican film, that's for sure, yes. Uh, unfortunately, I, I don't think I'll have a chance to see some of the others, but eventually I will. Now, I was uh, thinking about the circumstances in which uh, G20 presidency is being held by India and I was comparing it to the circumstances when Mexico began its G20 presidency way back starting December 2011. That was a time of multiple crises. Uh, there were lingering effects of the 2008 global financial crisis and the Eurozone debt crisis uh, particularly. And here there are differences uh, between the G20 member states, G7 and others, particularly around the Russia-Ukraine war, how its implications need to be tackled. It's a polarized world today. Do you think uh, India is doing a good job at uh, navigating the challenges in a polarized world and working towards consensus on issues of development that affect all? Yeah. Well, you know, the Indian uh, presidency, of course, has taken place in a very challenging international environment, for sure. But also, I think there's something that's very important compared to when, we, when Mexico held the presidency over a decade ago, is that the agenda of the G20 has expanded and multiplied tremendously. As you well know, the, when the G20 first started its work, it was mostly focused on issues of development and the, the financial uh, international structure, uh, those type of things. Uh, nowadays, the, uh, the, the G20 deals with these issues, but at the same time, it deals also with culture, with agriculture, with uh, 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 women and gender issues, uh, employment, um, digital economy. I mean, just the agenda is very much broader than it was uh, when, when, the, when the group first started. So in that sense, it's a big challenge for India. And I think that India has done an extraordinary job under difficult circumstances 
to hold all these meetings, as, uh, as, you, as you well mentioned at the beginning, over 200 meetings in uh, over 50 cities of, of, of India. So it's been, it's, it's, a, it's been a major challenge. And of course, the, uh, uh, the geopolitical situation has also enhanced the, the difficulties in achieving uh, consensus. But I think we, you know, we sh shouldn't focus so much on that because I think that aside from the geopolitical crisis, that is uh, now taking place in, 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 in Europe. Uh, the, all the other groups and the, the, and the ministerial meetings that have taken place, I th believe there were something like 13 different groups, have achieved uh, significant consensus. And also the, uh, the, the other, the, the parallel groups of the G20, like the B20, the Think20, uh, this uh, Civil20, etc., have also achieved significant advances in terms of, uh, of reaching consensus on forward-looking and action-oriented documents. So I think in that sense, already the Indian presidency has been very successful. For the benefit of the viewers, Ambassador, if you could tell us uh, that how different or similar is Mexico's position with India's position on the Russia-Ukraine war, India's following a policy of strategic autonomy here, and how concerned are you about the implications of the war? Well, we are concerned. I think, you know, obviously, even though this this is taking place in a geographical location that is far geographically far from us, nevertheless, the implications of the of the war uh, have a spillover effect to the rest of the world. Uh, this has been mentioned uh, consistently. For example, energy energy prices, food prices, and uh, food availability in some cases, uh, questions of fertilizers, etc. Uh, and just in general, the, 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 the fragility that this causes impacts all of us. None of us are absent uh, from it. It also has an impact on the multilateral system and the way that the international system functions and is, you know, how effective it is in responding to this type of situations. So obviously it's something that we are concerned about. And we have, as Mexico has always done traditionally, historically, have um, made calls for uh, peaceful negotiations to the two sides to sit down and try to reach a diplomatic uh, uh, understanding of, of, uh, of, the, of the issue. And this is something that we're you know, very firm with. And I think that India also has uh, espoused this type, of, uh, this type of views. So you are, in a sense, uh, treading a very thin line between Russia and Ukraine, treading a middle ground, so to say? Basically asking both sides to, uh, to try to come to, uh, to a peaceful understanding, a peaceful arrangement uh, to resolve the conflict. We obviously have uh, st been very firm in rejecting the uh, Russia's action. Uh, we have voted uh, uh, that way in the United Nations in the different resolutions that were taking, taken in the, in the General Assembly. And at the time when the, uh, the, the invasion started, we were members of the Security Council together with India. Uh, this was in the, you know, the last two years, uh, uh, 21 and 22. And, uh, and we were also expressed very strongly our, our, our position that this was an, an acceptable aggression, that it violated international law, and that, uh, and again, we made a call for both sides to sit down and negotiate a peaceful arrangement. Has India been instrumental in mainstreaming the voice of the Global South uh, in the G20 discourse? And where do you see this headed? Eventually, do you see the Global South uh, getting more space in the international financial architecture? Well, I think India is doing a, a, a big effort in that regard. As you know, in January, if I'm not mistaken, the, the Prime Minister held a video conference with leaders of the so-called Global South to hear their concerns, to hear their uh, you know, what were their, you know, their priorities so that India could in some way represent them in the G20 uh, discussions and negotiations that were about to take place in the course of, of this year. I think that was a very important element. Uh, a second one is that India, of course, is, is uh, espousing the idea of the African Union joining the, the G20 as a full-fledged member and also bringing this very important uh, continent of uh, uh, over 50 something countries that will be present at the uh, at the uh, at the table of the G20. So in that sense, I think it's doing a, uh, a very serious uh, attempt to bring the voice of the of the global south into the uh, into the table. Uh, it's of course is a challenge for all of us because it's you, you know the uh, uh, the 
the, the, the G20 itself has to, you know, in some ways, is, some, is a, in some ways representative of, of many, the, the, there are other countries that are of the, of the Global South that, that we are members of the, of the G20, Mexico being one of them, of course. So it's not like the, you know, there's an exclusion, but the idea is how to make it more representative, more inclusive uh, of, the other, uh, of other countries and other concerns uh, that, that should be present there. And as I said, I think India is doing a good job in bringing that, uh, that voice into the discussions of the G20. You mentioned India's proposal to have the African Union as a full member of uh, an expanded G20, effectively a G21. Is Mexico on board on that? We have uh, expressed our uh, favorable opinion to that, yes. Let's come to various sectors of cooperation under G20. On tourism, I heard you speak at a Think 20 event uh, on how uh, Mexico is doing in conserving natural habitats and promoting green tourism. Now, one of the initiatives under India's presidency is to have a G20 online platform for best practices that progress towards the SDGs. Right. Will Mexico be keen on putting out its uh, best practices for the benefit of all? Oh, absolutely. I think that one of the one of the uh, transverse, transversal issues that have come up in different working groups of the G20 is how best we can advance in the accomplishment of the SDGs, the, the 2030 UN uh, Sustainable Development Agenda of the United Nations. I think this has been the case in tourism, but in other, other groups, in other subjects, has also, it has come up in, in the issue of health, for example, and, and others. Uh, and of course, Mexico is very much in support of this. I think that, unfortunately, even though we're sort of halfway there, we're in, in terms of, of time to reach the 2030, we're not, we're not halfway there in terms of the accomplishments that we need to have so that by 2030 we have really fulfilled our commitments to the 2030 agenda. And Mexico is fully committed to do whatever it takes. And, uh, and one thing that we, have, that we have brought to the table in all these working groups is, you know, our own experience, our best practices, things that we can share with other countries. Uh, and we have also heard what other countries are doing in, in issues of, uh, of environment, of energy, uh, certainly of sustainable tourism, for example, which is very important. Tourism, and I'm glad you bring this up because it's a very important issue for Mexico. Tourism is one of the main drivers of the Mexican economy. We are, uh, in this past few years, we have become the number third or fourth uh, largest uh, recipient of tourists in the, in the world. And, uh, and this, of course, has an important economic impact, a positive economic impact in Mexico. And this is something that we're, you know, we're very keen in, in development. And we're working very closely with, with India, because India, of course, has also enormous potential in terms of, uh, of tourism. Now, tourism and culture are interconnected, and at uh, the culture minister's meeting in Varanasi, you had spoken about the need to combat illicit trafficking of cultural property. Now, India, as the G20 chair, is calling for a global coalition against it, and there are some other initiatives also that the Indian presidency has come up with, like upskilling in the creative sector or having culture as one of the goals in a possible post-2030 development agenda. Yes. Are these some fair goals that the Indian chair is pursuing? Yes, we were totally supportive of what the, what the Indian chair was doing in the cultural uh, working group. And uh, this issue of uh, illegal trafficking of, uh, of heritage and cultural goods is something that Mexico is very keen on. And this is something that we are working very closely. And we see we have exactly the same goals that India has uh, in this regard. And this is something that we, we supported each other in achieving this at the, uh, at, the, at the working group. It's very important because for, you know, India and Mexico, of course, we are two ancient civilizations. We have fantastic heritage in both of our countries. Uh, and let me just give you one example. We are the uh, uh, successive countries in terms of the number of, uh, of sites that we have in the UNESCO World Heritage List. Uh, India has 40, Mexico has uh, 35. A few years ago, it used to be we both have 35, but India has gotten more uh, mm -hmm. in, the, in, in this past, uh, past few years. So obviously this is something that we're very, um, that we're very committed to. And we're also very committed to, uh, uh, to recovering some of, the, some of the objects that have been uh, illegally obtained, that have been looted from some of our sites. And that this is something that is tremendously important for us as governments and as societies. 
and uh, one of the things that we uh, that we um, promoted in the cultural working group was the idea of culture as a global good, and I think it's something very important. And it is again, this is something where uh, India and Mexico were working together. You know, our priorities are very similar in that regard. Now, Prime Minister Narendra Modi, in his address to the Trade and Investment Ministers meeting, spoke of uh, an Indian G20 initiative of mapping global value chains. Do you think that there is a need for uh, a globalized re-diversification of global value chains instead of being dependent on, say, one particular country for uh, supply chains? And we saw the impact of that during the COVID-19 pandemic. Also, are you worried by the way Various countries in the global south, particularly, are saddled by unviable debt because of the machinations of one country. As you correctly said, I think the uh, the pandemic showed us the fragility of the of the uh, of this uh, value chains uh, across the board and all sorts of, of things. But particularly in some very important uh, issues, such as uh, you know uh, medicines and uh, uh, infrastructure goods that that uh, that were necessary for the development. Of, of all of our of all of our countries, so it's very important that we that we do this mapping, and that and, and more than that that we you know find ways to avoid a future disruption that that can have such a serious and negative impact uh, in our uh, economic development and in our social lives. So I think it's very important. This is something again that we find that uh, where the prime minister is is right on in terms of what he is uh, uh, proposing. We have to find ways to shield the, especially the less developed countries within the global south from, from this type of impacts. And uh, initiatives like this one that, that you've mentioned from uh, Prime Minister Modi and others, I think are headed in that direction. But this is something that we, as not only the G20, but I think the international community as a whole needs to be more committed to this type of, uh, of measures and this type of actions in order to prevent future disruptions. In the health sphere, we are seeing that the Indian presidency is pushing for a legally binding WHO convention in the near future on pandemic preparedness, prevention and response. Besides that, there's focus on a one health approach on combating mm -hmm. antimicrobial resistance on a global uh, digital health initiative where all the digital solutions of various countries will be put together on a single platform. How much does Mexico stand to gain through these initiatives? Oh, we definitely stand to gain for that, and we have been supportive of the One Health uh, proposal, and also the idea of of having international institutions that are better prepared uh, uh, to deal with emergencies like we had in the pandemic. We have to understand that the pandemic was not uh, a one-off uh, issue. I mean, it certainly was one that had a uh, a major impact in the whole world, but that uh, probably in the future we're going to see also other uh, health uh, emergencies that need to be dealt with in a prompt and efficient way, that we need to have the resources to deal with it in a faster uh, way. And, uh, and of course this is something that you know for us in Mexico it's also very important. Uh, we were very much affected by the, by the pandemic and uh, uh, and in general, you know, in Mexico, we have, uh, like India does, have, we have many, you know, uh, health issues that are, that are pending that we have to deal with that, uh, that are, you know, uh, the, the population demands the accessibility of, of medicines and, uh, and the health services that, um, that, that uh, we need to provide for them. So obviously, this is something that Mexico supports very strongly. In the agriculture sector, Mexico is uh, the outgoing chair of AMIS, which is Agriculture Marketing Information System, which uh, in a way helps address uh, food uh, insecurity issues and also ensures that there are no unexpected food uh, spikes in a sense. And uh, there are a lot of other proposals also that India has passionately taken up, like uh, research on millets and other ancient grains and climate smart agriculture. Currently, there is a crisis of plenty. There is a food and fertilizer crisis because of the war, because of the COVID-19 pandemic. There are several fragilities, like you said. How do you think in the short term something like this can be addressed? Well, I think the, you know, the, the first, the, probably the first uh, thing that I, that I will uh, say in that regard is uh, you know, if we can avoid the type of conflicts that are taking place. Because of course, 
you know, I think that one thing that we became aware of uh, with the conflict in Europe is how dependent we all were on, on the source of, uh, of certain uh, grains coming from one specific country. So obviously we need to be more, first of all, more aware of this thing. Secondly, you know, see how we can diversify and kind of, again, shield ourselves from, uh, from this type of, uh, of mishaps that will have a serious effects on all of us. You know, food security is something that is tremendously important for countries like Mexico and, uh, and uh, of course, for the global south in general. And this is also an issue where India and Mexico have collaborated historically. As you know, the, the Green Revolution, which started in Mexico, was brought to India uh, in, the, in the early 70s. And this is something that we have always been very working very closely in order to, to assure that our, our populations, our growing populations. Mm, the Sonora wheat variety came yes. from Mexico to India, which contributed to India's Green Revolution. Absolutely, yes. On space cooperation, considering Chandrayaan 3's success in a shoestring budget, uh, and uh, the fact that the Mexico Space Agency as well as ISRO have entered into an agreement in the past on cooperation in the space sector for peaceful purposes. Can we expect more uh, tie-ups in space technology between ISRO and the Mexican Space Agency? Well, the first thing I should say is that I want to congratulate India and all of Indians for this very proud achievement. And it's uh, something that certainly Indians should be proud of, of what happened, but, uh, but it's something that all of us around the world are very happy that, uh, that you guys have brought the moon closer to us. Okay. Uh, we have been, as you said, our space agencies, the Mexican and the uh, Indian space agencies, have been collaborating on the uses of space for peaceful purposes. Just uh, we've had a long-standing uh, memorandum of understanding between the two agencies that, and just recently in the past uh, year and a half or so, we signed an addendum for example, to, uh, to have a satellite observation to help us deal with natural disasters and you know, forest fires. And as we've seen, this is something that is, not, that is happening with tragic consequences in parts of the world, like in Canada or in Hawaii recently. So it's, it's obviously a something very important. We've had these problems in Mexico, you've had these problems in India. So this is something that, of course, that we see the immediate benefits of this cooperation. And we do hope that as we move uh, towards the future, that we'll have closer cooperation with, uh, with the Indian Space Agency. As far as some photographs that uh, you had reposted on your social media handles of uh, Y20 delegates who had come from Mexico for the Y20 summit here, what is the kind of feedback that you are getting on how Y20 is doing? And what is the potential that you see of youth exchanges between India and Mexico? Yeah. Well, I think that you know this is a, a probably one of the most important issues, and I think uh, some people don't focus on it. But the fact is that uh, we're doing all this for the future generations. I mean, certainly, you know, to some extent, for all of us, because we're responsible for many of the things that are happening in the world today. But we want to leave a legacy uh, of a better world for future generations, and that's where the youth of both our countries come in, and both Mexico and India have uh, the enormous demographic benefit of, of having very young uh, populations that are you know, very dynamic and very, uh, you know, uh, very entrepreneurial in, in many respects. And so the people that came from Mexico here uh, were tremendously enthusiastic. Mexico was the first Latin American country to recognize India after her independence. Where do ties stand currently? Is there untapped potential in this relationship? There's always more than can be done, certainly, but we have come a very long way. I think that you know, the, the, during the uh, first few decades after India's independence, we did have a very close cooperation with India, particularly in multilateral issues. We a lot of cooperation in the United Nations, uh, even within the non-aligned movement. Even though Mexico was only an observer of the non-aligned movement, we were very supportive of many of the things that India was doing together with other countries. But in the past. A uh, decade or so, our relationship has become much more closer, and uh, there's so there's of course the economic indicators that that uh, that bring this to the fore. We have become India's number one uh, trading partner in Latin America. Uh, India is now one of our top ten trading partners in the world, and even you know when you this is something that uh, that that uh, is not very well known, but it's really quite amazing given the distance that we have between our two countries. We're without an FTA. And without an FTA, exactly. Mm. So obviously one thing is that if we were to have an FTA, probably this will be even stronger. 
And what's important is not only that we have achieved historical levels of, uh, of trade between our two countries up to $10 billion, but the fact that it's growing, it's consistently growing, and not only growing, but it's diversifying. The, the, the basket of products that we are exchanging between our two countries is, uh, is diversifying constantly. At the same time, you have over 200 Indian businesses that are uh, placed in Mexico. Uh, that are doing business there, again, in a large number of sectors being from automobiles, from uh, fertilizers, steel, uh, pharmaceuticals, of course, and now the new innovative sectors like you know, with the startups, digital, artificial intelligence, etc. And, uh, and in Mexico, from Mexico here, you also have not, not, so many, not so many businesses, but again, the businesses that are here are, uh, the, the number of businesses here is also growing. But what's again most important is that, for example, the, the Indian companies that are based in Mexico, they're all doing very well, they're all growing, they're all expanding, they're increasing their investment, they're hiring more people. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, I mean, the, 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 the relationship is very much alive and very, and very active. And at the same time, we have a very good level of, uh, of political dialogue. The, uh, the first trip that Minister Jai Shankar uh, took to Latin America was to Mexico two years ago, almost exactly two years ago in September uh, 21. Uh, the former foreign minister of Mexico was here on two occasions uh, after that. Um, and in between there have been other visits. The speaker of, 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 uh, of Lok Saba was, uh, was in Mexico and we've had also a delegation of Mexican parliamentarians that was here recently earlier in the summer. But again, much more can be done and hopefully much more will be done in the future. There's a lot of interest in the US-Mexico relationship and there has been a dramatic shift in a sense in the relationship from the Donald Trump administration to the Joe Biden administration but again we are looking at whipping of tensions in the Republican campaign if you see they are talking about using US military to strike on drug cartels in Mexico. Does that worry you? Well, you know, the relationship that we have with the, with the United States is, uh, I would say it's a very, it's probably one of the most complex relationships that any two countries have in the world. Um, we have a very extensive border and it's a free and open border. That is, I think, is something that we should uh, underline because many times things are focused on the problems at the border. But you also have to see that the border is a region of enormous opportunity and prosperity for the people that live on both sides of it. Uh, and we know that every time that there's political campaigns in the, in the United States, this type of, uh, of statements flare up. And uh, so, I mean, obviously, you know, we take them seriously. Well, I'm not going to say that we uh, ignore them, but, uh, but at the same time, fortunately, we have enough channels of communication and enough uh, institutional framework that is so effective to deal with the many challenges that our relationship has, and uh, be it on questions of trade, be it on questions of uh, international crime, and uh, you know which is the, which is there, be it on uh, you know all sorts of other issues that we have between our two countries. So fortunately, I think that even though there may be these uh, political uh, uh, fireworks, uh, we have the 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 possibility of deal with these things in a more uh, uh, you know uh, um, a positive way so that we actually give it a constructive turn to see how we resolve the many problems that we have because i mean the problems are there but there's shared problems and we need to deal with them and i think that both the mexican authorities and the american authorities and the peoples of both countries want to deal with these issues in a positive way. Who's representing Mexico here in the G20 Leaders Summit? It's going to be our Minister of Econ Economic Affairs, uh, Raquel Buenrostro, uh, is going to be coming in, uh, you know, representing Mexico. We're looking forward really to welcoming her here in New Delhi. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Such a pleasure to and, speak. And thank you to all the audience that, that will be watching this.